Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our Go With The Flow project. Aww. We have Michael here working the cameras. Hello. And I'm so excited to do this project and the whole theme of this box is Let It Be. And it's all about, um, I feel like November things get really stressful and we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. That's when kind of things stack up and it's just such a busy time. So I really wanted to focus on creating projects that are fun, that um, we can release all of the expectation and pressure that we put on ourselves and just have a good time painting. Great? That sounds great. Okay, so we will be doing this project in five steps. So our very first step is we are going to be doing wet on wet, um, like ovals and dots for the background. Our second step is we will be starting to put in some dots, maybe a little bit of lines here and there. Our third step is we will be doing continuous line drawings of florals and leaves across our composition. Our fourth step is we will be doing more dots, maybe some splatters, adding some texture. And our fifth step is just any details we want to add on our flowers. Sounds great. Great. Let's do it. Okay. So I am using three paintbrushes for this project around two, around six, and around 12, but please use whatever you have, especially with a project like this, you can use literally anything. I also have two pens. One is a um, sepia micron pen, and then the other one is a um, Sakura uh, Pigma brush pen. It has like this gorgeous brush tip. Now, I just want to point out that on your step-by-step, -step, it's gonna say a Copic brush script pen, um, for this, but there were some supply chain issues and we couldn't get those, but we were able to get this pen, um, which has a really lovely tip. It's like the same exact tip as the other one. Um, so it's going to work just fine. Well, that worked out. Yeah, I know. They're like, we can't get you this one. We could do this one. I'm like, okay, that'll work. You guys want a little peek behind the scenes. Supply chain stuff is hairy all the time. All the time. Oh my gosh. No matter what. <laughs> it really is. Okay. And I'm really excited for this box because for the first time in a very, very long time, we have created new dandelion paint colors and we are using them for the first time this month. Ooh. I know. And I'm so excited because like, I feel like every artist has um, their favorite kind of colors to work in. And these are some of my favorite colors to work in ever. And they're very different from anything that we've made before with dandelion paint. So I'm really excited. So the first color that we will be using, I want to make sure I got the names right. This is blush, which is just like the most beautiful, soft blush pink, which is one of my favorite colors ever. Our second color is dusty rose. So it's more pink, but it's still saturated. It's not like in your face. These are, it's so good for florals. Um, these two colors specifically that I just can't wait for you guys to dive in and play with these. And then our last color here is golden yellow. And I just wanted like a really soft, warm gold yellow that doesn't have strong undertones of green. That's not like highlighter. I wanted it to be like, just like warmth, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So those are the three colors that we will be using today and I love them so much. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, let's get painting, but before we paint, I wanted to share with you a poem which reminded me of this entire box and this project from one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver, um, and then we'll do our oath and we'll get into painting, okay? Okay. So this is from um, Devotions and it's called I Worried. <clears throat> it says, I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it. And I am well, hopeless. That's how I feel. <laughs> I'm hopeless. In, is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. And I love that because I think that we get in our heads so much about everything and 
we realize that all that worrying does is just kind of exhaust us and it doesn't actually solve the problem. And what does it kind of amount to? Like nothing. And so when you are painting this project, I do not want you to worry about it. I want you to recognize that this is a time for you to let go of that worry. That's the whole point of this box and this project. We are letting go of the expectations. We are letting go of the worry of if we're going to ruin it, is this going to turn out? Am I going to make a mistake? That's not even going to be on our radar because we're just here to play and have fun and um, let it be. Okay? Sweet. So if you can raise your right hand. And repeat after me. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Thank you very much. Okay, so now let's start with our wet on wet. Now you can use around six, you can use around 12, you can use whatever brush you feel comfortable using. So I love, um, especially when I have new colors, I love doing this technique because it's a great way for you to familiarize yourself with colors while still having some fun. So I'm gonna take my golden yellow and I'm gonna start by just doing a nice big circle here at the top. And then I'm gonna rinse my brush and while it's still wet, I'm gonna make another circle that connects right to it. And you'll see that the color will start to bleed in. And if you want to help it bleed more, you can say, come on. Come, come on, little on. fella. Come on, little fella. Bleed some more for me. <laughs> you can also drop in color. The biggest thing here, though, is usually after you, like, make a decision, you can mess with it a little bit and then you move on. If you try and work back and forth with it too much, then all of the values will even out. And you won't get any, like, light and dark or difference and we kind of want to see the difference. Okay, now I'm going to grab some dusty rose and connect that. And then let's grab just some water. And this is just going to be what we do across the entire thing. Um, and I'm going to leave that to you to go off and be different than what I'm doing. Um, I also think it's kind of fun with this project um, to mess it up so it's not just circles, is I did some ovals. And then I kind of added like these kind of rainbow lines. And it's just for fun. I love that in other watercolor paintings, you spend so much effort not getting your lines to touch so nothing bleeds. And then yes. on some projects, it's the whole point. Yes. And I think you have to have both. You have to give yourself the freedom to play and also to um, to be tight. You know what I mean? Like it's really good to have both in that balance. And what you want to do is you want to work fairly quickly, actually, because the more quickly you work, um, then the more likely these colors will kind of bleed together and you'll get some really cool textures. Um, and also the other thing that I did because I was feeling like it was still feeling a little bit too round is after I made a mark, sometimes I just kind of smear it. Just a little, not a lot. And then just keep going. Do some dusty. So I'm kind of going back and forth between all of the colors. Again, we're really letting the water and the color do a lot of the work for us. It's really great. I'm gonna do a yellow one here. Maybe a darker pink here. And what I really love about these type of projects is we are celebrating the differences between them. Like already, this is different than what I had on my original painting. And already I'm gonna say like, this is gonna turn out really interesting. And all of ours are gonna turn out really interesting because they're gonna be different from each other even though we're doing such similar things. Doing the same steps even. Yeah, but they're gonna feel different. And that's what's really fun about these types of projects, I think. Okay. 
And remember, if you want him to move more, say, come on, little guy, move in there for me. I'm not here when you paint these originally. I'm only here for filming this part, but mm -hmm. I like to imagine that you're here alone in the studio, just talking to your paper. <laughs> Get out of here. Get out of here. Come on. Come on, guys. And then on some of them, you're like, okay, little buddy, come on. <laughs> I will neither confirm nor deny that I talk to my paintings <laughs> while I'm painting alone. <laughs> and again, I just want you to keep going. Fill up your paper. I feel like it's time for me to do another, like, loopy guy. Everyone was thinking it. <laughs> like a little boop. I want to call those uh, echoes. Okay, I like that. Or ripples. I don't know yet. Now, one thing that I want you guys to know about these new colors is because they're naturally a lighter value. Um, so sometimes, so you might go through the paint fairly quickly because, like you you'll want to do like two layers to get that saturation or to get that value a little bit darker and i want to say like that's okay some paint colors are just made that way where they're just such a light value um there's nothing wrong with them and you're not doing anything wrong that's just how they're made our tv when you don't like watch anything for a while has like a screensaver you know mm -hmm. and one of them is like this Underwater shot of a zillion jellyfish. That's what this painting reminds me of right now. I don't know why. I can see that. I can totally see that. It is very much getting giving yeah. jellyfish. Jellyfish, jellyfish vibes. Fish. Jellyfish vibes. Totally. And if you want to do some of these stripes and different colors and just kind of let them bleed, you can. And then again, sometimes I like to just take my brush and smear the color that's already there. Again, we're just kind of creating textures and movement, and I want to break it up with my mark making. Do you see how much this has changed just by creating some vertical lines as opposed to it all just being dots? So I just wanna show you that your direction of your brush stroke by breaking up things can add a different feeling to it. Okay, that's... That's it. That's step one. We did it. Now what we are going to do is we're going to let it dry and we're going to start adding some textural elements like dots. Um, and if you want to start playing with like different tools, like let's say you have um, bubble wrap and you're like, what happens if I take bubble wrap and like, you know, put it in here and then smash it on here? Like you can get some really cool stuff. I used pen caps to dip and then like literally play with whatever, like look on your desk and just be like, what can I play with? What can I use to create different textures? And that's kind of where we're going with this. Um, so I'm gonna use my heat at craft tool to dry this. Okay, now before we add the dots, I just want to say one thing, which is you'll notice that I got some really harsh lines right here, some uh, blooms. That's because I used my heat at craft tool. There was like a puddle down here from how wet the paint and water was and I used my heated craft tool and it kind of made it move and dry and that's why down here we have these really hard lines where up here it kind of just flowed naturally and didn't create such harsh lines that's because this dried naturally so sometimes if you have puddles on your paper and you're using your heated craft tool it creates more hard edges than if you were to just let it naturally um, diffuse out and dry do you think that one um, on the bottom if you let it naturally dry, it still would be pretty intense because of how you wet it was. You still would get, you would get something more like this. Okay. Probably not like this though. Okay. So you would still get it just not as intense and you can use that to your benefit or not. For me, I actually really like the textural effect that it created. It almost gives a feeling of alcohol links, yeah. um, which is really cool. So I'm not mad about it, but just, I wanted to give you that information in case something like that was frustrating you and you didn't understand why. I feel like such a fanboy right now. You just said your catchphrase. I haven't heard it in so long. I'm not mad about it. Oh my gosh. And if you guys are new, that came from like just what I'm talking about is we're painting and sometimes something happens and we didn't necessarily mean for it to happen. And we just go, oh, that's okay. I'm not mad about that. And it's more like just go with the flow. We and used to have shirts that said that. Yeah, we did. It was a whole thing. It was a whole thing. 
Okay, so I'm gonna take my round two, but again, use whatever brush you want. I'm gonna take some of my golden yellow and I'm just gonna start putting in some dots. And they can be big, they can be small. Again, we're not necessarily trying to create a certain image. We're just trying to add some, some color and some texture. And then I am a huge fan of smearing and I like to just use my finger. But just so you know, it takes a bit for this to get off your fingers. So if you have gloves, because you don't want paint stained hands, that might be a good idea. So we got dots. And then what if we take, let's take a pen cap. I'm just gonna use my sepia one. It'd be cool if you had a big dry wash brush or something to use that to just kind of. We do. We do that in another project. Am I magic? You are magic. Do, do I read the future? <laughs> okay, so I'm just dipping my um, end of my pen in here and you can just make circles. Just kind of play with it. See what kind of marks you can make. Everybody's is gonna be different. You can smear it if you want. So um, in college, you studied art, and I remember because yes. I was there. Yep. And you had a section on abstract art, and I remember because you brought home big abstracts, which still hang in our home, which I love. Yes. This reminds me a lot of that at this stage of the painting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would you consider this stage abstract? So I always understood, yes, yes. And I've always understood abstract art to be non-representational. So sometimes we think that if it looks a little funky, we think it's abstract. But how I was taught was abstract is making marks and having a purpose of creating the art that doesn't necessarily um, represent a dog or a flower or a landscape. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yes, I would consider this abstract art. Now, when we add flowers on top, um, and I'm, I'm saying this with hesitation because I remember defining abstract art that way of um, non-representational. And then someone commented on one of the YouTube channels with kind of a better definition that I think was probably more accurate. And so, and it's okay if there's representation in abstract art. I can't remember what they said, but I was like, oh, that's better. Maybe I should stop saying that it's <laughs> non-representational. But that's just how I was taught of how to view it. Um, but there's different types of abstract too, like abstract expressionism and things like that. It, it goes into different art history movements. Some of them are like color fields where it's more about how the colors interact with each other. And those are like the square ones where it's just like yellow or like blue and yellow. You know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about? Yeah. So, but to your original question, yes. So when you add the flowers on top, it becomes non-abstract per se because it represents flowers. Would you say it becomes collage? I wouldn't say it becomes collage, but I do feel like this tends to lend itself more to like a mixed media approach okay. because we're using pens, we're using textures. I mean, if I had, if this is where like literally you have art supplies that aren't watercolor art supplies and you're like, I don't know what to do with this, try it in these types of paintings and play with it. This That is the best way that you can familiarize yourself with product is through like just creating like this. I know it sounds silly, smear that. but it reminds me of food a lot. Like okay. watercolor, let's say like, you know, watercolor is rice and you know how it tastes because you use it all the time. Yeah. And you have like weird things, like these weird pens and stuff laying around. You know, you can always just like make rice and like this might be good on top of it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Totally. You have like a very good idea of what the rice tastes like already. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Okay, I do want to say one thing about the pen that we had to switch out, this um, pigment brush, is it does reconstitute when it is wet. So this is like, don't paint over this unless you're okay with the color smearing. And that actually worked out fine <clears throat> for this project and the other projects that we use it in. It's more of a last step kind of thing or after we've already done our washes. So it's not going to affect your projects, but if you guys should do something different than what I'm doing, and you're, I just want to warn you that if you draw or draw with this and then paint on top, it will smear. Hmm. Okay. Which that's, I don't get, I don't know. I don't get that worked up about things like that. 
Okay, <clears throat> so that was step two. Now we're gonna move on to step three and we're gonna do our continuous flowers and um, leaves. And I'm gonna demonstrate how to do that really quick. So I kept it fairly basic. And continuous line means that you do not lift your pen off of your paper. You just keep going and making the shapes, um, which is really a fun activity and is so good for your brain. It's an excellent way to practice your drawing, especially if like, <clears throat> let's say I'm trying to draw this jar, then like if I'm starting at the lip and it just teaches you how to practice um, like seeing what it is that you're trying to draw. You should like see the true shape of it. Yeah, like it's, they always look wonky, but it's such a good practice for your like eye hand coordination and for seeing what it is and for just like being loose and fun. Um, I'm not gonna make you do it blind, which is what I've done before, which is where you can't look at your paper. That's like an extra hard step. So we're not gonna do that this time. <laughs> we're just gonna do a um, continuous. But be warned, it's coming. <laughs> it's there. Well, it was in um, a project called Make Your Mark. I think it came out in March of 23. If you're interested in learning how to do a blind contour drawing, that's a great one. Um, this one, we can look at our paper. Okay, so when I'm doing my flower, basically what I like to do is I like to start in the middle and then I go out, I do the petal, go back in the middle and then do the next one. And it's okay if they overlap. And you can even go across. That's it. Awesome. That's just our flower. And <clears throat> if you wanna do a different kind of flower, if you're just like, oh, I, this is really fun. I wanna try this with, you know, a lily or something like that. Give it a shot. There's nothing wrong with trying it. Um, I felt like this was a fairly familiar flower shape. And you can even like... Is it a poppy? I don't know if I had a specific flower in mind. I'm going to call it a poppy. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, you can even like, if you have to go back over the same area a few times, that's fine too. Like, look how cool when you get so many different layers in there. Cool. Now, when it comes to leaves, we're going to do that same idea. Let me flip that over. Um, where we kind of start, and then you do the leaf, and you go out, and you do another leaf. Like, let it be loose. Let it be not perfect. I do not want you to spend your time doing a leaf, coming back, and matching it perfectly with the branch. I mean, you you can. I don't want to stop your creativity. But I'm saying this is just as valid as this. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's go for it. If you want to follow some of these round shapes as if they were the flowers, like I have a few like good circles right here, I think that's a great way to help you. So we can just start in the middle, make my way up. And you'll see that I'm not doing like super... I'm, uh, I'm letting my lines be wavy. You see that? Because mm -hmm. if you look at the petal of a flower, depending on the type of flower it is, it does have a little bit of a wave and movement to it, right? I don't know what happened here. This is just what my brain decided to do and I went with it and that's okay. A caterpillar made a cocoon in that petal and it yes. wrapped it around it. Yes, or maybe that, that petal just got twisted. <laughs> maybe it just got a little wonky. Like this is where we let go and we let our brains and our minds kind of not overthink it. And we just say, I wonder what shape I can make. And I'm gonna have it go kind of off to the right of my paper. I know you've seen it because I know I've sent it to you. But those people who do this two-handed Yes. At the same time, blow my mind. Yes. And they're like doing different shapes even two-handed. I don't know. Yes, that is amazing. I'm lifting up some of this paint that's still wet on here just so it doesn't catch on it. And I'm just going right over some of these like texture lines and everything. Don't feel like any area is too sacred to mess with it. Usually though, if you really, really love an area, you just kind of leave it alone. 
There was a horn outside. There was a horn I don't outside. know if you guys could hear that. <laughs> it's funny how sometimes the internet is so inspiring. And sometimes yeah. the internet is so disheartening. You're like, people are so good at things. I'm not good at anything. You know? Mm-hmm. I wonder mm-hmm. what happens. Why does my brain do that? Where sometimes I'm fine with it and sometimes it hurts me. I think it has to do with how we're doing mentally. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so I just added some florals. I feel good about the placement. I did them across my composition, so it felt like movement and kind of going um, like it's not totally static or still. Now I'm gonna do my leaves. And again, like look at your painting and look at the areas that maybe feel a bit bare. This feels pretty bare to me, so I'm gonna do some leaves going in this way. That feels bare. I feel like I can do something coming up here. So this is where, and this is excellent practice for those who are like, how do you work on composition? Working on paintings like this is excellent for your brain because it's not distracted by trying to recreate a real scene. You're able to look at it for how it is and then make adjustments for balance, which is such a huge part of composition. And so for me, because I'm not trying to make a real scene, because we're exploring and doing whatever we want, I can look and say, what areas seem bare? And if you're like, how do I tell an area seems bare? Where does it seem kind of like boring? Like your eye doesn't want to go to it because there's nothing really happening here. That's what's going on a little bit for me right here and right here. Do you see that? Yep. Your eye just doesn't want to look at it. (laughs) Also, call me crazy, but right now it kind of reminds me of the Julie painting that we did a couple months ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, totally it does. Okay, so I'm going to do some leaves coming in this way. And again, allow yourself to play with the shapes, with your mark making, with your lines. You can do your leaves big or small. And for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on other areas before I go back to this to see if there's anything I need to to do. Like maybe some of your leaves are really long. You know, like mm-hmm. why not? It would also be kind of cute with this technique where you did a wash and then lines on top. If you did maybe like garden vegetables, like rainbow (gasps) carrots. That would be so cute. Right? Yes. This is why I love also like these, um, the pen and ink illustration, like going over with a pen on top of your, your watercolors is there's so many things that you can do. I just, I just love it. It just is such a cool look. <clears throat> okay, so that feels good. And this gives me an, a good idea of like, where are more areas, where are the areas that still feel a bit bare and how can I add some interest or some texture on them? So I'm gonna do some splatters. And you might say, well, if you know that there's still bare areas, why don't you keep going with the pen? You totally can keep going with the pen, but sometimes you have to think about the differences between the pen and the washes. The washes tend to be really light and flowy. And if I were to do really heavy pen on top of the entire thing, it might flatten it or it might not create some spaces for my eyes to rest. So sometimes it's good to be like, okay, I want to activate the space here, but this pen is really dark and it's really stark against the washes of my background. So how can I add another something on there that doesn't feel as strong as a pen? Well, let's take some of this dusty rose and see how it activates that space without it being such a strong line. And let's actually do it in the blush too. Another tool that you can use whenever you're like, I need to fill this space, but I don't want it to be heavy because it will like distract too much. Use a lighter value of something. This This blush color is great because the splatters are so much softer that it adds a textural element without it being so strong that it creates contrast. You see what you see what I'm saying? I'm picking up what you're putting down. Okay, perfect. And then let's do. I want to add some yellow dots here. Because the other thing you can look at is color. Color also informs our composition. So you gotta say, what area looks too much the same value-wise or color-wise that I need to like introduce that other color there? And I felt like this was just feeling way too all pink. 
So let's add some yellow. You do some yellow dots. You can even like follow the shape if you want. That's cute. <laughs> Don't you love it when you put something down and you're like, that's real cute. Uh, yes, my favorite thing. <laughs> you're like, sure, sure, sure. Happens I know what that's daily, like. I do it. Daily. <laughs> I don't know. I want you to look at this painting and think, what if I just decided to like it? What if I just, si just decided to be okay with whatever happens? It's easy for us to look at our own painting with a critical eye. And I want to switch that up and say, what if you were just okay with whatever it is that you put down? It's like, good, yeah. try it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I feel really good about that. Now, our very last step is we're going to go in and darken some of the lines. Like, wherever I want the flowers to maybe pop a little bit more, um, we can add a center. And this one, you don't have to worry about doing the contour continuous line or the continuous line. Um, I'm just going to add center, maybe some dots going around my center, like little stamen. Sounds good. Great. Connecting. If you want to like do another line on top of some of these leaves, you can even do veins. And by darkening some of this, what it's doing is it's creating, um, different movements within my line drawings. So I'm not gonna darken every single one, but the ones that I do darken, it's gonna move it a little bit. It's gonna very create a feeling of like depth a little, even though you might be like, how is there depth in this painting? I don't know. <laughs> don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. I like what you said about just choosing to like your painting because I used to be the pickiest eater, like when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm still probably a little picky, but I am much better. And it's just because I decided I'm going to pretend to like this. Yeah. And I say that to my kids all the time because, like, they'll just out of the blue decide, like, I don't like, literally name something anymore. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, How, why? Yeah. Just pretend you do and then you will. Yeah. Well, it's almost, it's just kind of shows how strong our brains are because, like, for me, this is example if we're going with food. I hated mustard growing up. Like I thought mustard was one of the worst things in the world. And my brain created this strong anti-mustard thought process. And then I became an adult and I hated <laughs> mustard still. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to try this and I'm going to pretend like it's not mustard that I'm eating. So then I can say, do I actually like this or not? Like I literally had to tell my brain, this is not mustard that you're trying. This is something new. And only then was I able to look at it with this non-biased opinion of if I liked it or not. And it turns out I do really like mustard. And so like we have to do that with many things. And one of them we have to do that is with our art, especially if we have a tendency to be so self-critical. And so if we can retrain our brain to say, what if I just decide that I'm okay with where I am and what I am doing today? in my creativity and just see how that opens you up to be more experimental, to try something, to um, be more willing to share, to be more willing to explore. And it's when we have that freedom, when we're willing to be brave in that way, we learn faster, we find our creative voice faster, we're able to make what it is that we're supposed to make. Okay, and I do feel like I need a little bit darker lines here and there. If you want to smear it a little, you can. I do like it when it kind of just smears a little. I'm a smeary kind of gal. <laughs> also, I love your triumphant mustard story, but our ketchup bottle cries every time you open the fridge and leave it there. <laughs> she hates ketchup still. <laughs> okay, this is it. That's our project. We did it. Um, I hope that you had fun with it. I hope that you can see the value of letting yourself play and explore your tools. I hope that you can take continuous drawing and practice. Um, if you really want to get better at drawing along with your watercolor, then doing drawing exercises like continuous line or blind contour drawing will be an excellent tool for you to use to um, increase that skill. So thank you so much for painting with me. I cannot wait to see how your guys' painting turns out. They're all gonna be so different. And um, I really hope that you share them. So if you're on Facebook, you can join our Facebook watercolor group. That's called 
Let's Make Art Watercolor. And that's where you can share all the projects that you do with us. It's a very large but kind and supportive community. And if you need any of these, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. Thank you so much. Bye.